SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Our speaker today is Chris Galloway and he is speaking on the red alert and what is happening into our health care system. <coughs> Chris Galloway is an experienced community organizer and advocate for public health care. Born and raised on a farm in rural Saskatchewan, he has since spent most of his adult life living on Treaty 6 territory, first in Saskatchewan and for the last decade living in Edmonton. His past experience includes working for the Alberta Federation of Labour in three provincial legislative assemblies and for a variety of non-profit and community organizations. Outside of work, Chris is an active volunteer and community member engaged in social justice and the arts. For Red Alert, our public Medicare is at risk. Please welcome Chris Galloway. Great. Thank you, Bev. Uh, as she said, my name is Chris Galloway. It's good to see some familiar faces. I'm guessing some of them were the hollower, hollowers from the back. Um, and good to see some new faces as well. It's always great to be in Lethbridge. I often say it is my uh, second favorite city in Alberta. Uh, I think partially because it reminds me of home in southeastern Saskatchewan. Uh, and I see a Rough Rider jacket so we can figure out how we're connected uh, <laughs> after this because there's always some connection when you find someone else from Saskatchewan. Um, really today I want to uh, talk a bit about the kind of the state of our healthcare system in Alberta, touch on what the government uh, has been doing and why they're doing that, and then talk about what we should be doing in healthcare. So we have the arc I'm going to go through. But before I do that, I just want to mention Friends of Medicare, Bev mentioned I'm the executive director there. Uh, in case you don't know, I know many of you do, we are uh, a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization here in Alberta. We've been around since 1979, uh, really fighting to protect and strengthen our public health care system. Part of the reason we've existed for so long here is because you may know Alberta was the last province to sign on to Universal Medicare and the first to start attacking it. Uh, so we've been around a long time doing this work and I'm glad to be here today. I should also mention we do have a, a uh, chapter model. We have uh, you know Cheryl and Bev and others from our chapter here today that does work here in Lethbridge. So if you're interested in that, check out the table afterwards. Uh, but now to bring you the good news on what's happening in healthcare. Everywhere I go right now, I just make everyone depressed. It's it's real, uh, it's great. Um, so I'm just going to touch on some of the things that are happening uh, in our healthcare system right now. I know for those in the back, this slide is hilarious. I really just wanted to, to show you it exists. Um, so right now, this is a map you can find on the uh, AHS website that outlines the closures of beds and units that are happening across the province. As of today, over 30 hospitals have bed and unit closures, whether it's an emergency room, urgent care, obstetrics, acute care, surgeries, and this has been the case since spring. At least 30 facilities for months and months have had temporary closures. Some of these closures are going on. We saw RIMBY this week. It's been over a year since they've had obstetric services, so how temporary are these closures? Um, but really, it's happening throughout the province, most acutely in rural places. Another thing that's happening that you've probably heard a lot about in the media is the red alerts in our EMS system. Hundreds of shifts are going unfilled every single week for our paramedics. Um, the paramedic union has been talking about this for years, but especially the last few months. They had to create a new term, deep red alerts, to explain how bad it's got, because we've been in red alerts for so long that it's even worse than that, and they didn't know how to talk about that. So we're seeing that. We're seeing rural ambulances sent into cities almost never to return. There was the other day an ambulance from Vulcan went to High River, that went to Cochrane, that went to Banff, and it just keeps going further and further to respond to calls. And then there's not an ambulance available when people need it. You've probably seen tons of stories about this. 
I know last week you had someone speaking about this. We are in kind of a series of crises in our healthcare system around closures, around EMS, but also the drug poisoning crisis that's hitting uh, our communities across the province, including here in Lethbridge. This is the chart from the Government of Alberta website. If you can read it, you'll notice it's got a typo in it. That's them, not me. Double, double drug. Um, but we're in a real crisis. And when this government took over, uh, we had seven supervised consumption sites in the province, two more about to open. We're now down to five. You know that here in Lethbridge where they attacked uh, the busiest supervised consumption site in the country and closed it. Here in the city, uh, Lethbridge is seeing some of the higher numbers of overdose deaths in the province. It's offensive. I know there's people here who care a lot about that. There's stuff coming up in Lethbridge. I'm sure there'll be questions on that. Tied to that, you know, having that constant state of overdose crisis affects our EMS system, but also our emergency rooms. Uh, these are some recent news stories you've probably seen. The misericordia, people laying on the floor, on the concrete floor waiting for treatment in the emergency room. People lining up outside the stallery with their children, trying to just get in to see the triage nurse. Red Deer had something like a 14 hour wait time at their ER recently. This is happening across the province uh, at emergency rooms. So if you can get an ambulance and you can get to the emergency room, then you're laying on the floor. That's what's happening currently in Alberta. And it all dominoes, right? It's all connected. So we're seeing surgeries continue still to be canceled, to be deferred, to be sent to other facilities. People are waiting in pain for months and months trying to get surgery. Uh, we have a backlog from the pandemic that we're not getting caught up on because we're still in a pandemic. And I hear this all the time from folks in Lethbridge especially. You know, we have a government that went to war with doctors, has driven many of them out of the province. Uh, Lethbridge is our third largest city, and almost half the city can't find a family doctor right now. If we can't provide health care in Lethbridge, where can we provide it in this province? Uh, the yellow box is actually taken from the Chinook Primary Care Network today, where it's a warning saying, we're not taking patients, call 811 or go to the ER if you need support. And that's the reality for folks here in Lethbridge. And one more piece of good news of what's happening in healthcare. Um, we're still seeing a pandemic that's hitting our seniors care. We saw during the pandemic what a failure our seniors care system is to protect folks. We have workers working two or three jobs to get by. It's not about care at all and that system is a total failure. And we're still seeing, this is just the other day, outbreaks hit these facilities. You know, half the residents at this care home in St. Paul had COVID, they were sharing rooms because it's an older facility, so people with COVID sharing rooms with people without. A bunch of the staff are off, care needs aren't being met, our seniors care is failing and the pandemic is still on. People are still dying from it, cases are high. Talk to anyone with kids in school right now about what's happening in those classrooms. This is all happening at the same time. So, really, yeah, it all comes down to short staffing in the system. It, it's impacting the system throughout. Uh, it's the real issue we're facing. You maybe heard the Canadian Medical Association this week say the system's on the verge of collapse. Uh, the nurses unions, other healthcare unions, healthcare advocates are, have been raising the alarm for months. I started in this job in January in that very first week. We were saying we need a workforce plan to deal with our healthcare system in Alberta or it's going to fail. We need a plan that will retain workers in the system, will recruit workers into the system, and train the people we need to deliver healthcare. And we're not doing that. We're not seeing that from our provincial government. This is an urgent situation, and we're not seeing that. I'll give two examples of how they are not responding or even listening to ideas. Uh, in terms of retention, the paramedics union, HSAA, for months and months and months has been raising the concern that a huge percentage of our paramedics in Alberta are on casual contracts that rotate every 90 days. They don't have benefits, they don't have job security, they don't have sick days. We're burning them out and losing them because we won't offer them real jobs. That's a simple change we can make right now to fill shifts and we're not doing it. 
And the other piece of that workforce strategy that I wanted to mention, there's so much we could say about it, but I, I won't because I know there'll be questions, uh, is the training piece, which is really important for here in Lethbridge. You know, the government at a time when we're having a staffing crisis, we need skilled healthcare professionals, is attacking post-secondary institutions across the province, colleges and universities with cuts, with layoffs, tuition hikes, student interest on their loans going up. And we saw that play out here not that many months ago in Lethbridge. There's these secret bargaining mandates attacking the workers that leads to labor strife. I was down here on the picket line with the faculty in Lethbridge because that's the reality in our post-secondary across the province. So rather than showing leadership on workforce, they're doing everything they can to make it worse. And really, the point that I want to leave you with that I'm saying all over the province is that this isn't an accident. They're not just incompetent. Lots of people like to think, oh, Jason Kenney, he's just kind of a bumbling fool, didn't really handle the pandemic well. But this isn't an accident. It's their ideology. It's what they want to happen. It serves them to have long wait lists, to have people waiting in pain, to have people worried that they can't get an ambulance. Because when you do that, you can privatize it. It's privatization 101. You break it, and then you privatize it. And it builds the public support for that agenda. It justifies a move to privatize as much of the healthcare system as they can, as fast as they can, under the guise they're trying to help people with a system that's failing. But really, they're the ones causing that failure. We need to call that out to people and say there's solutions, because they are having success with this narrative. And part of why I want to raise that is that this isn't just Jason Kenney or the UCP or Alberta. This is a coordinated attack in Canada on our public health care system. We have corporations who see huge potential for profits off of our health. They're looking for every sliver they can find that they might be able to pull a piece off and make a profit off of our health care. And it's um, really since the start of the new year, if you follow the media, if you follow what's happening, it is a coordinated thing that is happening. Um, since January, when I started in this job, there's been privatization every month. These are just some of the headlines of our Friends of Medicare news releases I wanted to, to mention. I can never remember them all. We have a monthly meeting, and every single month there's been new privatization between the meetings since I've started. Uh, but you know, the community lab deal to Dynalife, the sweetheart deal for Dynalife to take over some of our lab services, food services, ophthalmology, uh, surgeries, 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 a million announcements on surgeries, uh, home care, continuing care. There's this committee on EMS. They're going fast and they're going hard to sign these contracts. There was also the bottom one, this scheme. I don't know if you've heard about this, but they were going to fly patients with their surgeon to Kelowna to a private for-profit clinic to do their surgeries. And against the advice of AHS, uh, surgeons, against the people in charge of surgical care in this province, all saying this is a horrible idea for care, for cost, all these reasons, and them responding, it's the direction of the government, you need to do it. Nothing can make it more clear that this isn't about providing care, and it's not about wait lists, it's about profits. So profit for that clinic in Kelowna on our public dollars paying for that profit. That is what's happening in our healthcare right now. They claim they have not moved forward with that plan to fly people, but we don't actually know for sure if any patients have been flown, because uh, they haven't told us. But really, thank you. I just wanted to go back to that idea that this is a coordinated approach that's happening. There's corporations, think tanks, columnists all lining up to say, the, our healthcare system's broken in Canada, we need to do something different, and that different innovative thing is privatization. These are just a few recent uh, columns. David Staples, you know, if anyone's ever read him, you probably regret it, but you know, really it's a thing. Our ICU's broken, you need to privatize it. Just throwing that out there. The second one on there is actually from just this week. And it's this convoluted metaphor about having an old car that needs fixing and eventually you need to buy a new one and that's our healthcare system. So we should privatize it because it's old and broken. Um, I won't get into why that metaphor is strange, but that was just this week in the Edmonton Journal and the Herald saying, uh-oh, I guess we have to privatize. 
And the other one I want to mention is this Richard Owens guy. He's a lawyer at a big firm that works for pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. And just to show how emboldened these private companies are right now, they are everywhere. They're in every consultation I'm at. They're really just like, how can they make money off of healthcare right now? They're such an opportunity. <laughs> so this guy writes an op-ed in the National Post about the, how the problem isn't drug costs or pharmacare. The problem is that pharmaceutical companies aren't making enough money. And it's not satire. This is a real column using words like, we need to stop stealing from drug companies that are making billions of dollars. But if only they just made a little bit more, they promise they would do a bit more research and try to bring down drug costs for everyone. But we don't need pharmacare. And this is happening all the time in the media right now. They're planting this narrative everywhere they can. There's think tank reports coming out all the time from groups like the Fraser Institute being like, oh, looks like we have to privatize. The government commissioned their own reports with McKinnon and others, all laying this narrative to people over and over again that we need to privatize. And it's not just them. There's a political movement. You may remember this McLean's cover. I just think it's a hilarious photo, so I used it. Um, you know, some of those, a couple of those guys have been replaced. One is about to be replaced. Uh, but really, they are coordinating across this country. We have premiers in most of our provinces who are attacking public health care, and they're working together to do it. We saw throughout the pandemic, especially with Saskatchewan and Alberta, you know, Jason Kenney would announce something and the next day Scott Moe would do it, and vice versa. When we look at the Alberta Surgical Initiative, which was the big you know, keystone policy of our provincial budget, it's based on the Saskatchewan Surgical Initiative, which was a failure, we could talk about if anyone's interested. But they're using the same policies. Doug Ford, the last couple of weeks, his announcements on privatization, it's the exact same policies across the country that they're doing, they're coordinating, and they're also coordinating their resistance to the federal government's role in healthcare. Mm -hmm. They're doing everything they can to ensure that the federal government can't do anything good in terms of our public health care. They're demanding more money with no strings attached. They don't account for the money they get. They're using our public money to privatize. So it is a real political movement. And I think we have to be aware of that, because here in Canada especially, people have this idea that Medicare is untouchable. You know, it's, it's our biggest accomplishment. We're proud of it. We want it. No government would ever attack it. It's too precious. But they are attacking it, and they're using others to lay the groundwork to build public support for that attack. It's happening, and we can't sit back and think, oh, Medicare's safe because we're in Canada. That's not true. And then I just wanted to talk about these folks as well. The moment we're in, there's a leadership race underway. The first debate was here in Lethbridge. I don't know if anyone watched it. Wouldn't recommend, but I did. Because one of the topics, one of the key topics of the debate was supposed to be health care. So I was like, oh, what are they going to say? We're in this urgent moment. What's happening with their platforms? What are their solutions? No idea. They didn't really talk about any solutions. You wouldn't know we were in a health care crisis. We heard gimmicks, about $300 for a health spending account. We heard Travis Taves talk about conscience rights and attacking abortion. You know, they're not talking about the health care system. That was the first debate. We're now weeks and weeks into this. We still have no idea what these folks, who could be the premier in two weeks, think about the situation in our health care system. They're not even talking about it. It's very concerning. And I also, at the federal level, don't watch those debates either, but that leadership race that just wrapped up for the Conservative Party, we had John Charest, the moderate in the race, come to Alberta to say we should tear up the Canada Health Act. That was his announcement. We should have two-tier health care in Alberta. And this is supposedly the mainstream candidate that was in that race. So I just think we need to really be aware that this is happening. It's real, and we need to act. So I just wanted to talk about, after that very cheerful uh, state of the, the healthcare system, what should we be doing? Right? What can we be doing differently? I get asked all the time, you know, people recognize there's a crisis happening. They recognize there's staffing shortages, these, these issues. And they're like, yeah, but what do we do about it now? Right? So I think part of it is beyond having that workforce strategy really coordinating that piece, it's really changing our thinking and kind of triaging 
our policy decisions, to have that upstream approach of how we can remove burdens and pressures on our healthcare system, looking at things like the social determinants of health and being like, how can we keep the system from failing in the short term while we rebuild it over the longer term? And just going to talk very quick about each of these little things. Here's just some of the things Friends of Medicare has been advocating that we need to do. So I've talked a lot about the workforce strategy and really the need to reduce pressures on the system however we can. But we also need a strategy for this pandemic. It's still happening. People are still dying. More people have died this year than last year and we're not done the year. Um, you know, there's a school in Edmonton that most of the school is off with a respiratory illness, uh, unnamed respiratory illness. Uh, it's still filling up our hospitals, it's still delaying surgeries. We know it's airborne, we could be doing things about it. We could be making public spaces safer, we could be really addressing this uh, in a serious way to relieve that pressure and that burnout from the system, we're not doing that. Harm reduction, so important, we need to be keeping people alive, people are dying at record rates, it's so upsetting. You know, Four people every single day in this province are dying from an overdose. And we have a government that runs around talking about recovery. They're focused on recovery, re recovery-oriented policies. Well, you can't recover if you're dead. Mm -hmm. And people are dying every single day. It's offensive. And also, if we want to talk about recovery, let's talk about mental health and addictions, because we're failing on that front, too. You can't even access addiction treatment if, when you need it in most of the province. So uh, it's rhetoric. It's an ideology, and we need to fight back and really push those harm reduction solutions, which also relieve pressure on our EMS system, on our hospitals, and so on. Uh, it's, it's not even, ugh, it makes me really mad, but I will move on. Um, another thing we've been talking about all summer is heat waves. Right? There's things we can do. Every time there's a heat wave, we see a spike in ambulance calls. We see a spike in hospitalizations and emergency room visits. We'll all remember, I'm sure, the heat dome last summer. It's hard to forget, even over a year later. You know, next door in BC, the government announced you know, how many people had died. A lot of people died during that heat wave. They did a coroner's inquest into it. They had recommendations. The province has taken a leadership role in having a provincial heat alert system. They have funding for communities to try to deal with the like heat zones that happen in cities because of pavement and a lack of trees and all these things. They have funding around air conditioning and supports for folks who are unhoused. Uh, they're working with municipalities to ensure people have access to water. All these things around heat waves that are going to be more and more common with climate change. Here in Alberta, we've never even admitted how many people died during that heat dome. We haven't released that data. We wrote to the government, we called publicly for them to take action heading into this summer because we knew it would be hot again. And the response we got from the minister was, you know, we, people should watch uh, the weather uh, network. Here's a link, you can check it out. Uh, and if the heat warning happens, they should prepare accordingly. Because there's a heat warning system already, they should just watch for it and somehow that will solve it. So really our municipalities have been left scrambling to deal with this. Edmonton had you know, water on fire hydrants, some other things they're doing, but they can't do it alone. We need a provincial system, it shouldn't be based on where you live. And there's other climate events we should be preparing for too and admitting those are happening. Just a couple other things. Housing is healthcare. Across this province, people are living in encampments and tents in our parks right behind this building, it is happening. You can't be healthy living in the park. We need to house people. And I don't know if you've seen the news from Edmonton, uh, but we've built hundreds of supportive housing units in Edmonton with federal money. One of the buildings is three blocks from where I live. And the province will not fund the operating costs to allow people to move in. They are finished units for hundreds of people and they won't give a few million dollars so we could actually have people move into them. And that's across the province. Two more things, obviously there are cuts on AISH, seniors benefits, the drug plan, all those pieces uh, are making people less healthy. And then we really need to uh, look at those expansions. There's this potential now federally with the deal between the Liberals and the NDP to finally have pharmacare, dental care. Those things are just the smart thing to do. They save money, they should be part of the system. If you listened to CBC yesterday, you would have heard some great people from Lethbridge call into the show about dental care and what it means to them. So really, what do we need to do? We need to fight back right now. You know, we have a new premier soon. We know there will be an election by next May. We also know we're in a moment where 
uh, people's top concerns, if you go door to door, if you pull them, wherever you might go, healthcare and affordability. They want to talk about healthcare. Everywhere I go, people are concerned about healthcare. It's an opportunity for us to organize and mobilize to make it a top election issue, but also to ensure that they don't succeed in taking that anxiety and getting people to buy into the idea we need to privatize. So it's an opportunity, but it's also a risk. But I think you know, if we do that work, if we organize, if we check out the Friends of Medicare chapter here in Lethbridge uh, and really talk to folks, uh, we can sway the results of the election. And then at this time next year, no matter who the premier is, whether it's Rachel Notley or Daniel Smith or Travis Taves or whoever else, We've built that framework and that public support to ensure that no matter who is in government, that we're fighting for our public health care system. So really, thanks for having me. I want to hear from you, take questions from you, and we'll go from there. Well, thank you all for being here. I counted about 50 people. This has been our largest turnout ever. And so thank you so much. Now we'll take your questions. And if you can line up sort of behind this table here and then come around to this microphone and ask your question. I know you're just chomping at the bit. And here comes Maria. <laughs> Thanks, Bev, and thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm Maria Fitzpatrick, and um, I want to know how we can counter uh, the messages that are going out about uh, privatizing. Um, I worked in the federal government for uh, over 32 years, and I watched Harper dismantle as much as he could uh, services uh, that are provided by the uh, federal public service. And Kenny did the same thing here, Doug Ford's doing it, etc. So how do we counter that message? Because if we want to change the outcome in an election, we have to get a message out that people listen to. They're listening to this garbage. How do we get them to listen to the truth? That's great. That's a good question. One of the good things I've uh, seen for the last few months talking to folks, I've also been going door to door a lot and other things, is that people really don't believe that privatization will save money anymore. If you say we shouldn't be spending our public health care dollars on profits for these companies, they agree. There's not that debate anymore that somehow the private sector is going to save a whole bunch of money and bring down the cost of health care. There's very few people who believe that. And so if you just really call it out, you can have a good conversation with people. And they'll ask you questions like, well, what can we do then? And you can talk about you know, how we could do that. But it's actually interesting to me. I'm you know, from, if you know where Estevan is, I'm from a farm outside of there, slightly, slightly conservative place in Saskatchewan. And even while I was home this summer, yeah, slightly, Grant Devine was my MLA growing up, if you know who that is. Um, they don't buy it. They don't buy that this privatization is going to help them. You know, there's a sliver of people who think they might be able to pay and skip the queue, but that's not most people. Uh, so really just talking to people about it, uh, they, they get on board. You know, they're not sitting around thinking about it, but if you talk to them about it, they, they agree with us. In like, so they have yeah. to vote. Yeah, and then they have to go vote. Uh, and then also hold the feet to the fire to no matter who gets elected. I saw Rob in the building earlier. If he gets elected, we'll hold his feet to the fire. Yeah. Oh, thank you for all that good news. Yes. Uh, Barb Phillips, uh, I think it was a couple days ago, Travis Taves was at one of his meet and greets. And I'd like to know if Friends of Medicare have the stats because he his big lament is that the problem with staffing would be solved if only we allowed all the thousands of people that are in the province that whose credentials have not been recognized if we could get them boots on the ground in jobs our problems are solved are there stats that this shows I, or is it just malarkey <laughs> i like the word malarkey so i'll say that um 
part of this too, and back to Maria's question for a second, is that people also don't buy that creating a private surgical center will somehow create more surgeries. You don't get a new surgeon and new nurses by doing that, you're just moving people out. And they believe that. Um, to his comments, conservatives love to talk about the idea that, oh, we just need to deal with credentials. You know, there's people in our country who could be working. And that is true. We have a horrible system in this country for recognizing people's education from other countries. We don't really provide a clear path for people that have training to like get to the spot where they could work here. Uh, it's really just this individual thing. People have to go back to school often and just redo the whole program because that's the easiest way to finally get to work here. Um, but there's not like, you know, how many doctors are we lacking just in Lethbridge? So there's not like hundreds of doctors hanging out in Alberta who, who are trained somewhere else just waiting to be a doctor here. Same with nurses, et cetera. Really, what we need to do is retain the people we have desperately as step one and then start recruiting people into the system, whether they're from elsewhere with credentials that could be working in more skilled jobs than they're currently working, because that's the other issue. We often have people trained you know, as a nurse or something who are working as a care aide because it's the only job they can get in Alberta, but they actually have more training. There's people trained as surgeons who are working in like strange jobs that don't involve surgery really because they're not recognized here. So the, you know, we should be looking at that as part of a recruitment strategy, but there's not a magical number of people that we could just suddenly have working uh, in a few weeks, right? That's, you know, they love to talk about that and then when in power, they never do it. So, you know, they've been in power for four years and they haven't done nothing on credentialing for people. So, yeah, I would say it's malarkey. <laughs> So my name is Mark Edel, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Alberta's Tomorrow's Project. I'm not sure if everybody knows about it, but it's a project that's been running for several decades now. They're following um, thousands of Albertans, to, and it's mostly was tailored for uh, cancer. But they had a sub-project too, and that sub-project was uh, monitoring COVID. And I'm part of it, and my wife was part of it. Every three months we had blood sample taken. They were looking to see if we had antibodies. There are people that weren't vaccinated. There was those that were vaccinated, and they're following antibodies. And also they had a, uh, another test that could also tell if you had COVID, vaccinated or not. And all of a sudden, it was being folded, almost at the same time that Alberta stopped testing. And I'm just wondering, my question is, who is funding this Tomorrow's Project? And who decides when projects are going to be folded or not? Because in my view, as a scientist, this was the most interesting time to keep following, to see what's happening. My feeling is that the government doesn't want us to know. They don't want to know how many people are getting it. They're not testing. We don't know. So I'm just wondering who is funding it and who makes those decisions? Yeah, that's a good point. And I don't know that specific. I would have to look it up. I'm guessing the provincial government was funding it, but I do not know. Uh, I would guess that, you know, we had the best summer ever, so we didn't need it anymore uh, would also be the answer. Uh, and that, it's a good point, though. We're, we're two things, really. The government, we, we put out a release laying this out not long ago. They're very data adverse whether it's COVID and testing and tracking, whether it's overdose deaths where they were hiding the numbers from Edmonton for a while. There's all these examples where, you know, even the deaths in the heat wave, they won't even tell us how many people died from extreme heat because they don't want to deal with it. And it's over and over we're seeing that. So I'm assuming the study fell to the same mentality that if we track it, then we might have to do something about it. And we are seeing that. That's something I didn't raise, but long COVID is a thing. And we're not really, there's like one clinic, it's oversubscribed, you can't get in without a PCR test. There's all these issues that we're just kind of pretending that this isn't a problem in our healthcare system. So I would have to look up that specific study, whether it was a provincially funded study, but it is part of a pattern of really not wanting the data so that we don't actually have to deal with the problems. We just pretend the pandemic's over, we pretend long COVID isn't a thing, and you know we pretend everyone's recovering. Uh, and then we don't have to do other things. We don't have to have services or care for people because uh, we don't track it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> Terry Shillington. Uh, actually, as a participant in the Tomorrow Project, I found myself interested in Mark's question. Uh, Mike, I think your remarks implicitly uh, uh, are a critique of the opposition in Alberta, and uh, that's okay. Uh, my question is around what do you think the opposition could be doing better that it's not, and uh, if you were to draw up the game plan for an opposition party, what would you include in it that you don't hear now? Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
Like just, that. just trying to figure out how we're connected. Musha, okay. Um, yeah. Please repeat the question. Yeah, why? Well, forget how he worded it. Um, uh, yeah, the opposition platform. Yeah, basically, uh, if we were the opposition, what would we look for? Um, so there's some. There's lots of good coming from the opposition. They're talking about public health care all the time on their social media. Um, you know, David Shepard, the health critic, has been out on almost everything I've I've talked about. Um, there's there's kind of two issues that concern me about the election and after, if there is a change in government. One is our current government has admitted, with their privatization agenda, that they're locking us in. They're signing long-term contracts with guaranteed volumes to ensure a future government can undo it. And the minister has said that in press conferences, that if they lose, it doesn't matter because they're locking us in. So I am, it's hard to say in terms of some of the privatization what I would love to see in the platform. Obviously, we would like, you know, labs should be public, um, surgery should be public, et cetera. But we don't know what's in those contracts, what the penalties might be if we break them. Um, so I think some of that would have to come once we could see those contracts uh, with a change in government. Um, but I would like to see them talk more about, you know, and we'll get this. I'm sure there's not really a, a costed platform around, you know, what they'll spend on healthcare. Uh, and, you know, while they agree on, like, we need a, we need a staffing plan, we need to deal with seniors care, et cetera. They're not really giving specifics at this point, uh, and that always concerns us, uh, especially around seniors care that, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of change between governments, and part of that is because of the contracts and privatization. But um, yeah, I think just more details. You know, in terms of what they're saying, it's good, but what they're going to do would be my question, uh, while also recognizing that we don't know all the answers, right? Um, we would love to rip up all those contracts and make everything public, but who knows what they say and if that's reasonable. Hi, I'm Tony Pargett, and um, just want to pick up on your comments on privatization. I'm very encouraged to hear that people aren't really buying it anymore, because the argument never made sense to me. I, I worked in a major corporation for 25 years in a position where I had to kind of both understand and communicate the strategy, or at least create a strategy from what was happening. And, uh, you know, I know a corporation won't invest in anything unless they can see a 15% return on investment. And then the arguments made that, uh, well, private capital can go in instead of public money having to go in to, you know, fix things. Well, that's borrowed money. It's borrowed at a higher interest rate than governments get. So now you're talking about a 25% return on investment before it's worth investing in. So how could this possibly be any better, you know, and, and, and save us money? So I'm glad that argument is fading. But as to what we do now, you know, um, there is an election in May. Right now we have a government that, when it's not destroying things, is doing nothing because they're distracted. Um, there are some short-term things we could do between now and May to try and stop the damage. But I get antsy when we start saying, well, whoever's in power, we're going to hold their feet to the fire, as if it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference who's in power. Um, wouldn't you agree that nothing serious can be fixed unless we get rid of this destructive government come May, and uh, maybe that's what we should all be focusing on? Absolutely. It matters who's in power, and we need, and I've said this all over the province, we need a new government. Regardless of which of those seven people becomes our premier, we need to get rid of this government. Absolutely. Uh, but we are a nonpartisan organization at Friends of Medicare, so I wouldn't tell you who to vote for. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we need a new government. Uh, there are examples, I sometimes tell this story, um, where this government has backed down. There's very few. I think we can pick specific fights between now and May and maybe get somewhere uh, before getting rid of them. Uh, the insulin pump uh, issue, I'm sure many people remember. There are moved to cut the insulin pump program uh, to save $8 million, which obviously would just cost us more in the healthcare system almost immediately. Um, but we, you know, Friends of Medicare, 
one of the reasons us being around so long is helpful is we were part of getting the insulin pump program back in the day. That was our campaign with the community. So when the cut happened, we knew people, they called us immediately, and we started to organize immediately, help them have a press conference, um, had like these meetings with people across the province, and put up a, a tool where people could write to their MLA and the minister. And within days, like 5,000 people had done it. Like they were very motivated. In the end, something like 21,000 people just bombarded the minister in a couple of weeks, and they reversed the cut. Uh, and not only did they reverse the cut, they expanded which pumps are covered, and they're consulting on other changes to the program to make it better. Uh, so there are moments when you can just really just like punch them in the throat, uh, and sometimes they react. There's been very few of those moments with this government. Um, so we are always looking for those opportunities, uh, but absolutely, I would encourage everyone to uh, talk to people about voting, because we need change desperately in this province. Hi everyone, my name is Chrissy. It's super intimidating to come up here and ask a question, but Chris, um, the biggest thing about healthcare and getting folks to care about healthcare is they don't really care until they need it, right? And like that's one of the biggest shortcomings. Uh, and then obviously sometimes it's too late. Uh, one thing though I wanted to ask is some of the privatization is super subtle. Like I didn't even realize that the labs are getting privatized. I mean, we're the engaged folks here, we're reading the news, but a lot of folks aren't. And you know, they change the process, you just have to book online now. And you don't even really realize that's because it's been privatized. What are some of the education pieces we can get out there to kind of teach folks who don't read the news cycle, who don't really understand that these types of things are happening? Yeah, good point. Those are all great points. Thanks for coming up here and asking a question. Um, and you're right, like in terms of delivery, most people don't care as long as they can get what they need, right? You don't, you know, they go to the lab, they do their blood work, they don't know or care who's doing it. Um, so part of it's focusing on those issues where it's impacting people's lives, and you're right, most people don't care until they need something, and then they expect it to be there when they need it. But right now, so many people are experiencing, you know, calling for an ambulance, their child being taken in a fire truck to a hospital because there's no ambulance for hours, um, waiting at the ERs, not having a doctor. They're feeling it very directly in their day-to-day -day lives which I think creates an opportunity to talk about what's happening. And, you know, frankly, nobody cares if their ophthalmologist, I can never say that word correctly, is running a private clinic or in a public clinic. They don't even know. And that's not the issue we're going to mobilize people on, but it's their experience trying to access care right now that I think we can talk to people about, right, and really mobilize them on those issues um, that they're feeling. Uh, and not, you know, the long list of things that have been privatized aren't the things that are going to mobilize people for the election. It's really like, what's your experience accessing healthcare right now? And this is how we could fix it. And this is how they won't and aren't. And they're making it worse. If that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, I sort of got sort of a two-edged sort of thing. All these things that have been going on have been going on for 50 years. Um, you know, the people that I trained with for 25 years in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland, in a period of time over 20, 25 years, 50% of the people we trained as orthopedic surgeons went to the US. That's a very expensive brain and talent loss and they loved having them. Five of my colleagues are heads of departments in the US in their training programs. So they're very good people. Um, there used to be the sign at the Calgary airport for Kalispell, Montana, come and get your surgery there. Prior to COVID, Kalispell, Montana was doing more joint replacements on Canadians that we were doing in Lethbridge. The current cost of getting a standard joint replacement in Alberta, you know, if you don't have major problems, is about $10,000 Canadian. If you go to the U.S., it's four to eight times depending on the price. My sister recently went down there to Phoenix to get her knee replacement done because she'd been waiting for two and a half years. There were nine other people on the plane coming back from Phoenix that were Canadians had been done. Now, my concern is that money has left the country. So 
if we spend all that money, it's not going to Matsalan. Why we can't we keep that money in Canada and keep our nurses, physiotherapists, healthcare aides, whatever working? It would be much better for our country. All, all good points, Neil Ray. This is not new. Uh, it's probably the kind of crowd I could use the word neoliberalism with, and you would you would know what it is. Um, but really, we've had decades of austerity, of strain on our healthcare system, and the pandemic really just like punched it in the face and really caused this crisis. We were already stretched to the limit heading into that. Um, but you're also right that, well, two things. Uh, those companies are advertising everywhere. I, you know, I'm from just north of the American border in Saskatchewan, and all the time there's ads to get Canadians to come buy healthcare there to skip the queue, right? That's happening all the time. There's also ads, if you click on them on your phone, it's really, really interesting. If you click on one, you get a thousand more. Um, there's ads to try to steal our healthcare workers, because we are in a competition across North America for skilled healthcare workers. And so my phone now thinks I'm a nurse, and I get ads all the time. Do you want to be a nurse in Nova Scotia? Do you want to be a nurse in Montana? Better hours, better pay, right? Um, so we are in this, this competition to keep people here. So those are all very uh, good points and important points around uh, what's happening. And I also, you know, I don't blame people who have chosen that have the means to skip the queue after two and a half years. And I think we need to, uh, you know, sometimes there's a tendency to try to attack people for their, for their choices. And I don't think that's helpful in this instance. Uh, what we really need to do is have it so no one's waiting for two and a half years to get a surgery here. Um, and the other piece, there was the comment on corporations wanting to make a profit. Um, TELUS Health, you may see everywhere now. Um, they're not doing it to provide care. Uh, they're, you know, they're in it for money. But they're also poaching our, our doctors to do it, right? Because uh, you can do, you can be a doctor through TELUS Health instead of being a doctor with a clinic that you have to run and staff, uh, and you can live anywhere as long as you have your license in Alberta. So why not close your, your PCN and uh, go do that and live somewhere warm in the winter, right? Uh, so that kind of poaching is happening too with these corporations who are only doing it because they can make money. It's not about care, right? Leona Jacobs. Um, so there's so many things. <laughs> Light bulbs going off in my head. Um, so when you mentioned the insulin pump, my head went to the approximately, I will average it out to about 35,000 people who fought back on coal mining in the eastern slopes. And ostensibly we got that, cha that suspended, we won't say changed, but suspended. Um, and of course now we have Atrium who is suing the government because, you know, and so that's how, you know, the, the lock-in of the, of the corporate model, and this is what happens, is that when you back off from it, then you get sued. <laughs> and this happened, of course, with the free trade agreement in, our, in the lead in the, in the petroleum. But um, there's just, like, again, there's so many things going through my head. But one of the things that, that brought me up here was to mention two things. One is demographics, which I didn't see on your list of factors because I think demographics and COVID have played together and a lot of people who were on the cusp of retirement decided I'm out um, and that has created some of the labor shortage and because of the inverted demographic pyramid we don't have people to replace the, the baby boomers that are, are leaving um, but the other the other piece I wanted to bring up was how do we combat the narrative and I've heard Kenny say it you won't have to pay for this private surgery. It's public dollars. We will, it, it's still single, single payer. You know, you, we pay. You pay through us, through taxes, we pay. You don't have to pay out of pocket. How do we, how do we combat that particular narrative? Because that comes back to bite. Absolutely. First, before I, I speak of those, Leona's from Weyburn and, you know, home of Tommy Douglas, and I drive by that statue uh, whenever I go home, so Saskatchewan. Everyone's from Saskatchewan. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, the, you'll hear that all the time from the government around uh, publicly funded. They use all the time as yeah, publicly funded healthcare as they stand at a private clinic that they're going to spend our public dollars on doing procedures in and take them out of the public system. Um, I think it's that same conversation that people don't want their public tax dollars spent on profits when it could be spent on care. 
you know, they're deliberately using the phrase publicly funded to try to get people not to be as worried about it. You don't have to pay, you don't need your credit card, it's fine, it's publicly funded. Uh, and I, we, you know, we can challenge that very directly of like, if we have the money to do this, why aren't we spending it on doing our own surgeries, right? And not getting that percentage off the top in profit uh, over the long term. So it's the same conversation, I think, but you're right in the language they use, they're very intentional in how they talk about that. Oh, it's like Maria's making a run for it. Uh, and then, oh, what was your first question now? Demographics. Oh, demographics, that's so true. We're actually seeing two things happen. You're right about the pyramid. Uh, lots of people retired or have retired throughout the pandemic or are thinking about it, often retiring early. But we're also seeing, uh, you know, a lot of nurses and others, uh, health professionals, paramedics, who within three or five years of being new are quitting and finding other work. So we're seeing it at both ends of the, the new workers and the experienced workers are leaving the system and that's really uh, why we have such a focus on the need for retention. How do we keep people working in the system? How do we have work conditions that are bearable for people? How do we get people off shift on time so they're not completely burnt out? You know, uh, I, I'm around a lot of healthcare workers and if it's their day off, their phone is ringing nonstop to come in because they're so desperate for people. So really, Looking at that retention for you know folks at the top, what would it take the, uh, to stay a year or two longer, or what kind of job would they stay in to help? And then how do we keep people who've been trained from not leaving within five years or moving to the U.S. or moving? I know of a nurse in Saskatchewan who moved to a private surgical center because she could work Monday to Friday, nine to five, and have a family and a life. Right? And she supports public health care, but she's like, I couldn't do it anymore. This job I can do. Uh, so how do we, we look at all those pieces, both for new workers as well as the people who've been there for a long time? Um, it's, it's crucial. And you're right, we are at this retirement peak that's very concerning, especially with people leaving early. Hi. Uh, first, I want to apologize because I came in late because I had a doctor's appointment in Coaldale. <laughs> and that is part of what I want to talk about. I, um, oh, Ken Sears, sorry, I thought everybody knew me. Um, we know that there were at least 14 doctors short of what the bare minimum requirements were for Lethbridge, and that was about a year and a half ago. What I've never seen, though, is any statistics on the number of doctors that would have in the past been in the small towns around Lethbridge basically from Vulcan to the American border. Because those are the people that politically tend to vote for the government in power. But they're also the people who get ignored. They're the communities that get ignored and just taken for granted by that government. And you can get just as sick in McGrath or in Milk River as you can in Lethbridge or Calgary and just have just as hard a time finding a doctor. I did try and look up the number of uh, hospitals in this province that were did not have emergency hours. And it's quite staggering. I mean, there, you know, there are dozens of do hospitals across this province where you cannot get an emergency service if, you know, you get sick in the middle of the night. So the question is, and as I said, Chris, I missed the beginning, so maybe you talked about this. Where do we go from here? How do we go and not just reach out to Calgary, Edmonton, Red Deer, Lethbridge, but to the McGraths and the Pincher Creeks? How do we how do how do we get them to start to put political pressure on their representatives? Yes, the infamous Ken Sears. We do all know you. Uh, thanks, Ken, for that. Uh, and it's true that the rural places are feeling this more than anywhere else. Um, and we don't want to see a system which we're already seeing happen, where rather than be upset with the provincial government or, or attack them or lobby them, they then start doing these schemes where they're like, oh, well, the municipality could provide a clinic for them or do a top up or look at housing allowance to try to lure the doctor to their community in this kind of race to the bottom where we're all competing with incentives on top of what's already being provided rather than having a provincial strategy to have doctors and healthcare workers in communities. Uh, it concerns me a lot to hear Bow Valley uh, and other communities are doing that to try to like be the one that the doctor comes to, and that's, that's a losing strategy over the long term. Um, 
you missed out, there was a tiny map that nobody could read that showed the closures across the province uh, earlier. Um, but you're also right that when those folks in those communities do speak up, it's powerful. And we saw that with the insulin pump issue. Um, I met people from communities I didn't know existed uh, that came to the legislature to protest that who were going to their MLA office, talking to them in these places that you don't normally see that activism. And if we could ignite that on other issues, I think we should, would see success. And that's part of why, you know, Friends of Medicare, we're a provincial organization. You don't, uh, you don't make change from an office in Edmonton is my motto. So I'm here in Lethbridge, you know, for the third time since I've been in this role and I'm trying to get anywhere I can go where people will invite me, including smaller communities, uh, whether it's, you know, Camrose is still pretty big, but um, all these communities, if people will have me, I will come and I will talk to them and I will help them uh, with whatever they're working on uh, for sure. So you're right that that is a, a crucial point. And, you know, I don't think most of those communities will decide the election, but they will definitely create pressure. Uh, on the politics. So, yeah. And this will be our last question. And it's a quick one. So how much did the taxpayers of Alberta pay for Kenny tearing up the contract with the doctors? <laughs> I don't even know how you quantify that because how many doctors have we lost? That's pretty expensive. Um, and same with, uh, there was the super lab when they first got elected that was supposed to be built that they canceled. We've tried foiping that. We don't know. It was uh, like they were working on the ground. Like it was a project underway, canceled mid-project. We don't know what that cost either, right? Uh, they don't care about ripping up contracts and wasting money uh, and then turning it over to private entities for cheap. Um, but yeah, in terms of the doctors, who knows, right? We lost so many doctors. The long, short and long-term implications of that will be, I don't know, even know how you would calculate that. But yeah, good point. Thank you, Chris. And now we have one last question for you. And that is, since you've given us such a depressing <laughs> talk, <laughs> what positive message can you leave our audience with and our TV audience as well? Yes. It's amazing people invite me back. I don't know why. After I come, I'm like, well, everything's failing. How are you doing? I uh, hope you don't need an ambulance today. Um, I think it goes to me. I've really been hanging on to the insulin pump uh, fight because uh, it wasn't just the people directly impacted who obviously very quickly responded, but it really showed me that Albertans do still believe that we should care for each other. You know, they were very clearly, no, like you're not taking insulin pumps away from children. Absolutely not, that is ridiculous. And they were willing to speak up and fight for that. And I think they feel the same about our public health care system. And if we go talk to them, you know, have these conversations about what's really happening, uh, what the government is doing and why they should care, I think they'll get on board as well. So I do feel hopeful about it. Laying out all the bad things before the hopeful message is, you know, real, emotional arc for everyone, uh, but I'm actually very excited that so many people even today, you know, it's your biggest crowd since you've been back in person because people are thinking about healthcare and they want to do something about it. So thank you for being here and thank you for having me.